And you are listening to a live teletown hall meeting with State Representative Kevin Cotter of Mount Pleasant. We're joined tonight by hundreds of constituents across mid-Michigan. If you would like to ask a question of Representative Cotter, you can press zero and you'll be connected to an operator. So again, the ground rules are simple. If you'd like to ask a question of State Representative Kevin Cotter, you can press zero and you'll be connected to an operator. And Kevin Cotter, I know that you value this type of opportunity because listening to your constituents is, of course, such a big part of your job. Well, it really is, John, and, and this is uh, uh, something we started doing recently or what we call these tele-town halls, and it's a great opportunity to reach out, not just so that people at home can, can hear me speaking, but, but more importantly, so that I can hear them, uh, so that we can take questions and that we can respond to those questions uh, as openly and directly as, as possible. Uh, so teletown halls have become a great tool, and uh, we will spend some time on the line tonight taking those questions. Uh, I wanted to share, too, uh, with folks, uh, you know, the number in the office so that uh, they can reach out with questions. Is uh, They may not come up uh, yet tonight, but when they do, uh, always free to reach us at 517-373-1789. And we also hold uh, monthly office hours uh, here in the district. It's at the Isabella County building, uh, which is located on Main Street uh, in downtown Mount Pleasant, uh, room 320. And we're there on the second Monday of each month from 9 to 11 a.m. And again, the ground rules here tonight are very simple. If you would like to ask a question of Representative Kevin Cotter, you can press zero and you'll be connected to an operator who in turn will connect you with Representative Cotter. Obviously, there is a lot to talk about tonight and no topic is off the table. Now, Representative, as I was saying, I know you do spend a lot of time listening to your constituents as you're talking to people, listening to people this summer. What are some of the common threads? What are you hearing about? You know, I'm, I'm getting a lot of good feedback right now, spending a lot of time uh, uh, whenever I do have available time to, to get out and talk to people, uh, whether that's at community events, uh, actually going around door-to-door uh, -to -door right now and checking in with people and saying, uh, you know, a lot has been accomplished over the last uh, year or so, and, and wanted to check in just to see your thoughts. And, you know, it's interesting because in, in years past, uh, when I would get around in the summer months, I would often hear about a handful of issues. Uh, this year, there seems to be greater attention on a single issue, and that is the issue of road funding. And so I'm taking that a step further and saying, you know, we're not just identifying the issue, but let's dig deeper on that. And, and what are you willing to accept in, in the way of, of solutions to fix the problem? We, we know that our road funding has been stagnant uh, because it's been a fixed cents per gallon. We pay 19 cents per gallon since 1997. Uh, that actually goes to the roads. And so because that amount is held constant, uh, we see ourselves going backwards in the condition of the roads. And so the issue really is is, is how do we fix it going forward? And we're, we're spending a lot of time right now trying to be very thoughtful. Uh, when you look at road funding, that's not something where you, you shoot from the hip and throw out a new solution, but, but rather uh, do a lot of in-depth study and, uh, frankly, a lot of listening. And that's what I'm doing now in, in talking to uh, uh, members of the community and finding out, uh, you know, what uh, – what is more acceptable uh, in, in the uh, broad array of solutions that exist to, to get more money directed toward our roads? And again, if you would like to ask a question of your state representative, Kevin Cotter, you can press zero and you'll be connected to an operator. Again, if you'd like to ask a question of representative Kevin Cotter, press zero and you'll be connected to an operator. And right now we do have some calls that are starting to come in. Right now, let's go to Fred in Coleman, who's calling in with a question about a state contract. Good evening, Fred. You're on with Representative Kevin Cotter. Oh, good evening. Thanks for taking my call. How are you? Very well, Fred. Thank you for uh, your patience. Uh, please go ahead with your question. My question is, I'm wondering why the Airmark or the Armark Corporation was allowed to keep their contract with the state of Michigan with all the violations and all the people getting fired. Yeah, thank you, Fred. That's a good question and, and frankly, a, a very timely question, uh, as that's been uh, in uh, reported on in pretty great detail here recently. And what Fred's referring to, if I can give just a little bit of background for those that may not be uh, familiar, Airmark is a, uh, a company that provides, uh, amongst other things, food service uh, in, in large settings. Uh, for example, uh, Airmark has provided the food uh, services for years at uh, Central Michigan University right here in the district. And so what had happened in an effort to try to save dollars, a uh, decision was made to 
uh, privatize some of the food service within our prisons. Uh, and, and you know, I hear a lot about prison funding and money that's spent on prisons, and sometimes it's, it, it is in the same conversation of road funding, which I was just talking about, and people often say, you know, we're spending a little over $2 billion a year on the cost of our prisons to, to keep people incarcerated. Uh, you know, you need to find ways to save that money. And so that's what happened here was Airmark was pursued as a way to save some money when, when feeding our inmates, and that's a huge cost. Uh, but there have been some issues uh, with this Airmark contract. Um, Airmark came in and showed that they could save the state money. However, there have been uh, some issues uh, in the implementation uh, and when it comes to conduct of uh, the contracted workers and amongst other things. And so what has happened just recently, uh, the, the governor took a very serious stance on this and, and uh, actually fined Airmark uh, $200,000. Uh, as a result of their lack of performance in that contract. Uh, Fred's question went, uh, you know, to why are, are they still able to provide that service, so why hasn't it been taken away? I think this $200,000 fine was a, uh, a first step. It, it's kind of a, uh, a shot over the bow, I think, by the governor to say that uh, you better get your act straight uh, because I, I expect the next step will not be another fine I would expect. Uh, while I can't speak for the governor, I would expect that that contract would uh, be in jeopardy uh, if that level of, of service continues. So that's what I know on the earmark contract. Uh, I, I think we can take some comfort in the fact that that $200,000 fine was assessed because that means that the administration is watching this closely, and at the end of the day, it is the administration's uh, discretion as to whether or not that contract is continued. And again, if you would like to ask a question of Representative Kevin Cotter, you can press zero and you'll be connected to an operator. Right now, let's go to a call from Richard uh, in Lake. Good evening, Richard. You're on with Representative Kevin Cotter. Yes, I would like to ask uh, Kevin if he would favor uh, doing something like they're doing in New York with the tax-free zones for for new companies, startup companies, for uh, tax abatements uh, for 10 years to get new business in the state. Okay, well, thank you very much for that question, Richard, and I'm, I'm familiar with what you're uh, referring to. I actually uh, haven't been able to watch much TV recently, but I did see uh, probably about a half hour uh, just two days ago, and, and I noticed a commercial uh, that was airing, and I expect this is what's prompting the question. Uh, it was a commercial that was put out by the state of New York, and it, it uh, showed a map with many different bright dots across it, and these are uh, business tax-free zones that uh, New York is doing in an effort to try to entice businesses to uh, to um, head to New York, I presume, uh, as well as probably expand within the state. And I, I would be a, a bit hesitant there. Uh, the reason I say that is I certainly favor um, all that we can do to keep taxes low for everyone. Uh, but one thing that gives me some pause when I see tax-free zones and when you see dots on a map, that means that it's not the same for everyone everywhere. Uh, so they are picking... Uh, which communities are going to potentially stand to gain and which communities are going to continue uh, as a status quo. So that would give me some, some caution. I, I actually like the way that, that we handled this just in 2011. 2011 was my first year in office about uh, uh, three and a half years ago, about well, just over three years ago. We changed uh, what was called the Michigan Business Tax, and that's the way that we tax businesses in Michigan. And we leveled the playing field. We made it uh, more level for all businesses across uh, the spectrum, regardless of size, uh, so that they could compete. And, and we got away from this way that it was done in the past that really picked winners and losers, in my opinion. And so I like to keep the, the playing field level, uh, you know, allow good businesses to flourish, and those that, um, you know, uh, need special treatment to flourish, well, maybe that's not the best use of taxpayer dollars. So to answer your question, I like uh, being more broad-based and not picking which communities would flourish and which wouldn't, because I already know that would really set up a fight uh, as we look at, you know, uh, the district that I represent, primarily very rural, with the exception of the city of, of Mount Pleasant. You know, so do we say that, uh, you know, Mount Pleasant is going to be selected as tax-free, but Shepherd would not, or maybe Coleman or Lake would not. So we have to be very cautious with that. But I think that the uh, the system that we passed in 2011 is showing good results, and uh, I think we need to give that more time uh, to prove itself. And, you know, Kevin Cotter, Michigan's economic recovery, Michigan's job picture is getting national attention even today. Business Facilities Magazine issued a report saying that since the start of 2011, Michigan is second in the country in terms of the speed and strength of its economic recovery. That's definitely good news there. 
Well, it is. Uh, you know, it wasn't too long ago, thinking back to 2009, 2010, uh, as you look at all the ratings, and there are many different ratings uh, that, that uh, you know, spectators will rate the states on, and Michigan was really at the top of all the wrong list, in the bottom of all the right list. And, and so here to hear uh, about Michigan being second to only South Carolina in our rate of recovery, that's tremendous. And I think it's the result of a lot of these changes. You know, we, we just talked about uh, the changes that we made in the business tax. Uh, there are many other areas of change that have been made, and that's one of the things, frankly, that, that is a bit frustrating for me in my role. You know, we want to come in, we want to see things turn around immediately, uh, but it takes a little bit of time because not only does it take time for the policy that we enact to go into effect, but then it also takes time for those results to be seen. So this today, this news that came out uh, is reassuring to me. It, it says that things are heading in a good direction, uh, but at the same time it says that uh, we can still do better. And again, if you would like to ask a question of Representative Kevin Connor, you can press zero and you'll be connected to an operator. Right now let's go to Connie in St. Louis who has a, a question about phone service. Good. Waiting for the call to come up. Good evening, Connie. You're on with Representative Kevin Cotter. Hi. I'm wondering, We you passed, uh, and I know you didn't vote for it, but the um, no landlines, that, and that's to take effect in 2017. And I'm wondering if you have any idea how us, uh, how we will be able to have any kind of service um, in our area, I live in a very rural area out in the Pleasant Valley area, and there are very few cell towers. Um, I do not get good, dependable cell service in my home. Connie, thank you for that question, and, and thank you also for the point that you made uh, when you acknowledged that I did not vote for that, and I'd like to explain why. Uh, you are right. It is 2017 is the, the year uh, in which this would take effect. And, and the issue here is talking about doing away with landline phones. And, and it's important to point out a couple of things. One is, what do we mean by landline? And what I think we often think of as landline is, is a phone simply that's plugged into the wall versus uh, a wireless phone. And that's not how the industry looks at landline phones. So what they're talking about when they say landline phones are the old traditional copper line coming into your home. And, and what is true in, in many areas is that even without a resident knowing, many phone lines have been changed out, so it's no longer that traditional copper uh, coming into the home, but it's now a voice-over Internet protocol or VoIP line. And so the industry has been switching these over, but, but my concerns were aligned very much with yours, Connie, in that we have a very rural district here. I represent all of Isabella County and the most rural parts of Midland County. And you get outside of the city of Mount Pleasant, and you're in rural country, and you're in an area where quite often there is not cell phone service. And that's a serious concern. And so at the end of the day, I could not support this bill because I could not take comfort in the expectation that cell phone service will continue to increase and more of these landlines will be converted over to VoIP lines. Because what about the situation if that doesn't happen and you have somebody with a medical alert, for example? Let's say that you have a medical condition, you have the medical alert button that uses the phone lines. And if the Internet goes down, even if just temporarily. That could be a very serious situation. And so at the end of the day, uh, much to the chagrin of the industry, I could not get behind this. And um, I, I hope that I will be, uh, my, my concerns will be addressed and that in 2017 this will not be an issue. But we actually have uh, areas that we don't even traditionally think of as rural where I drop cell phone coverage on a pretty regular basis and I use Verizon, which is a major carrier. So I just think that uh, for some of our more major metropolitan areas, maybe this is not a concern, but uh, we are still in the rural part of the state. And uh, for me, it uh, just wasn't something that I could take comfort in, knowing that I had many uh, constituents at home that had major concerns about this. So I, I appreciate uh, you raising that, Connie. Thank you. And again, if you'd like to ask a question, you can press zero. Representative, we have some poll questions tonight, too, that you're going to be asking the folks who are listening to our Teletown Hall. Maybe we should go to our first poll question of the evening. Uh, another important issue that has been on a lot of people's minds is the issue of education funding. As you know, Representative, there has been some confusion regarding this issue, and I'm sure the people listening would like to hear the truth about what is behind that funding issue. 
Well, you're absolutely right, John. I mean, uh, you know, I can't tell you the number of people that I've talked to uh, who are a little bit tired of what I would call fuzzy math uh, that some are using to try to distort numbers on education funding. And, uh, you know, while we're on the subject, uh, before I get into the details of this, I, I think we should, uh, let's take a poll question and, and find out uh, kind of what the what the public sentiment is right now on, on education funding. And, and uh, here, I, I you know, let's talk solely about uh, K through 12 education funding. So the question goes, based on what you have heard, do you believe that education funding has increased, decreased, or remained about the same? Press 1 if you believe that we have increased funding. Press 2 for decreased. And you can press 3 for stays about the same. And we're starting that question right now. So you can press 1 if you believe that education funding has increased. Two, if you believe it has decreased, and three, if you believe that it has stayed about the same, and we'll let those votes come in right now. While we're letting people call in, uh, let's go to a question from Mylan, who is calling up with the question about the gas tax. Good evening, you're on with Representative Kevin Cotter. Hello, Kevin. Uh, am I looking at something crooked or not? I figured that we have a 6% gas tax. So for every gallon of gas, it's 6 cents, or is it on the dollar? So like when gas was 50, it was 6% of 50 cents. And then when it was a dollar, it was 50 cents. And now it's 350. So tell me if I'm looking at it wrong or not. Well, thank you for the question. I, I think that's an important one to clear up. Uh, you are correct in the sense that there is a 6% tax on gasoline. But what that is, that is not what we refer to as the gas tax. That's not the portion that actually goes to the roads. So when you go to a station, I bought gas earlier today, and I, I re, if I recall correctly, it was 3.58 a gallon. Okay, So that 3.58 a gallon, that includes all the taxes in it. And one of the taxes, the tax you mentioned, is a 6% state sales tax. So just like you go to the store and buy a shirt and you pay the 6% uh, sales tax on it, that is already calculated into the price uh, that's on the sign. But that is not the portion that actually goes to the roads. The part that goes to the roads is a fixed $0.19 cents per gallon. So since that was put in place in 1997, we have been paying $0.19 cents per gallon on each ga gallon of gasoline and $0.15 cents per gallon on each gallon of diesel. And so the reason that the formula is what I call now broken is because 19 cents has remained the same even while we've experienced some inflation. Now, to make matters worse, we, we have a situation where, uh, you know, in part because of oil prices, material costs have gone up, labor prices, labor prices have gone up, but probably equally as important, if not more important, uh, or having a bigger impact, is the fact that uh, – Mileage uh, has continued uh, to get better. So whether you're looking at you know the traditional combustion engine uh, getting better fuel economy, I think what's even having a bigger impact on it is the fact that we see more uh, an expanded use of plug-ins and hybrids. Uh, so these are vehicles that are using the roads that are not paying that fuel tax, or at least not paying as much per mile traveled. So again, to your question, that six percent is on there, but that is the state sales tax, and that goes to fund uh, primarily education and also a portion of it goes to fund uh, local government revenue sharing. And again, if you'd like to ask a question, you can press zero, 0 right now. Representative, let's go to the results of the poll question that we just asked. And we asked, based on what you have heard, do you believe that education funding has increased, decreased, or remained about the same? What were the results? Okay, for increased, we had uh, 29%. Decreased was 46% and remained about the same was 25. So again, 29% increased, 46% uh, decreased, and 25% remained. It was about felt it was about the same. In 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 the question, we talked about the the fact that you know there has been some misinformation out there, and I want to clear that up. Um, you know, when I started in 2011, we did have a difficult. Uh, budget year. Uh, when we took office, we had the $1.8 billion deficit uh, that we talked uh, a lot about at the time, and, and that forced us to make some, some difficult challenges. And there were some challenges in school funding. But overall, while overall funding in that first year was down, 
our education funding really comes from two primary sources. There are state dollars and there are federal dollars. And as a result of a tailing off in federal dollars, uh, there was a reduction in what was received in the classroom, or I'd say it accurately, it was more of a flatlining, uh, but state dollars were actually up. And each year that I've been in office, state dollars have increased uh, to education, but it was an issue of federal funding tailing off. But even with that tailing off in the federal funding, overall funding to the classrooms is up. And what's even more important to our area is you look at uh, Mount Pleasant Public Schools, you look at Shepherd, you look at Beale City, you look at Coleman, you look at Bullock Creek, and the list goes on. We have the lowest funded schools in the state, not the absolute lowest. We're at the lowest tier because we really have tiers when you look at how funding comes into the schools. And so one thing that we've been able to do is to what I call fight for the bottom or raise the bottom, and that is to say that when more money is available for education, as we've had the last couple of years, rather than spreading that across, kind of taking this peanut butter approach, we have put an additional amount into the bottom to raise the bottom so we continue to close that gap uh, because I feel strongly that the students of Isabella and Midland Counties are every bit as important as the students of uh, Birmingham or Bloomfield Hills or wherever you want to go. So we, we have had some successes in uh, raising the bottom, but this is something that we have to continue. Uh, but to get you know back to the polling question, uh, funding has gone up each year uh, of the last four years. So it, it is a priority. I feel strongly, you know, as we look at our uh, budget and uh, as we look at the, you know, the so many areas of spending that the um, that the uh, state is involved in, we really need to bring it back to the priorities. And I think there are three priorities uh, in in uh, state government, and they they should be uh, education, roads are often referred to as infrastructure, and public safety. So public safety, education, and infrastructure. And you know, I think if we focus on those priorities, uh, then we could also find a solution to our road funding problem uh, because maybe we shouldn't be in some of the areas that we're in as a state government. Let's get back to the basics and make sure we do those very, very well before we even consider uh, going into so many other areas that we're currently funding. You know, Representative, you talked about coming to Lansing in 2011. Since you came to Lansing in 2011, when you've talked about dialing back in state government, one of the places you have started was in your own office, and actually you came into office taking a, what, a 10% cut in salary compared to legislators of the previous term. So certainly the House of Representatives, the legislature, has not been immune to belt tightening. You know, I think it was important to start there. You, you think about 2011, you, you come into office, you have a billion eight uh, is the deficit. And we know at that point there are going to be some serious cuts that, that have to go around, and, and we have to find ways to do that through efficiencies and, and frankly, some reductions. But that's where we started is we looked at the government first, and we said, okay, we're part of the problem here, and we need to tighten our belts. And so that is true, and that's something that uh, is often forgotten. Frankly, I often uh, forget about it as well, but it's true. We, we did take a 10% pay cut uh, as legislators. That's something I came into. Uh, we also cut state budgets for legislators. Uh, we have each office has a... Um, budget that is used to uh, not only pay staff people, but to buy the pencils and paper clips we use in Lansing. Uh, that took a, a reduction. Uh, we also did away uh, w with retiree health care for legislators. And we said, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a privilege to serve, it's an honor to serve, uh, but do we necessarily need our health care paid for by state government when we retire? And, and I think uh, the bulk of us uh, came together and said, no, we don't. Uh, so we made the, that reduction. And so it's just um, it's a matter of saying, okay, we're not above the problem, we're part of the problem, and we need to be part of the solution, and that's what we did. Again, if you would like to ask a question of State Representative Kevin Cotter, you can press zero, and you'll be connected to an operator. No topic is off the table tonight. So if you'd like to ask a question, you can press zero, and you'll be connected with an operator. Uh, several people, representatives calling in about uh, about roads, right now let's go to Randy in Mount Pleasant, who's calling in with a question about just that, calling in about roads. Good evening, Randy. You're on with Representative Kevin Cotter. Hello, Randy. Can you hear us? You there, Randy? You know what, Representative? I think we might have lost Randy's call, but it uh, looks like he was calling in with a road question. There are a few other Calls still online here. Right now, let's go to John in Mount Pleasant, who's calling in with a question about hybrid vehicles. 
Good evening, John. You're on with Representative Kevin Cotter. Good evening. Thanks for taking my call. Uh, with the funding being primarily for the gas road taxes, being from gas tax, um, why aren't they looking at uh, taxing the electric cars and hybrids more? Thank you for the question. Roads. Yes, absolutely. I I, uh, I hear you loud and clear. This is something that we're actually talking about right now. And so your question is, you know, uh, I assume you're looking at equity, you know, certainly not penalizing uh, alternative source vehicles, whether they're hybrids, whether they're plug-ins, whatever the case may be, but providing some equity so that those that are using the roads are, are paying, paying their fair share. And, and I feel strongly right now is we're looking at this grander solution uh, for road funding that equity uh, has to be part of this uh, for plug-ins and hybrids. And the reason I say that is if we're going to get it done right now is the time to do it because while these vehicles are on the roads, they're not on the roads in a, in a huge number when compared to uh, other vehicles. So we need to do this now before it becomes too big of a challenge. Uh, and I have some early numbers. and I know we're still under 30,000 uh, as we look at the number of these vehicles that are on the roads that are licensed in Michigan. And, and the way we could do this is to look at the registration fee because right now our road funding uh, really comes from two sources. One is the fuel tax that you pay at the pump, that 19 cents per gallon, uh, that's roughly half of the funding. Uh, the roughly other half comes from your vehicle registration fee. Uh, so each year on your birthday when you renew your plate. And so what we could look at uh, with plug-ins and hybrids is to look at, based on the manufacturer's uh, statement of mileage, we could do a prorated uh, registration fee increase. Again, with our goal being not to penalize, because uh, you know there's no reason to penalize uh, these vehicles, but rather just to make it uh, equal. So based on an average number of miles driven, per se, we could, uh, we could increase the registration fee, and then everybody is equal uh, in that share. So that's something that we're looking at right now. And, and again, I feel strongly that we need to uh, do it now uh, because we fully expect that usage of these types of vehicles is going to go up, and uh, it will be more difficult uh, to get uh, the support to get the vote done uh, when these become more common. And, you know, Representative, twice now in about the last eight months, we have seen an infusion of additional state dollars toward roads across our state, and they've been primarily geared toward local roads, which I imagine is something that you hear about from your constituents are probably telling you, Representative Cotter, we want to see money going into those roads that we live on, that we drive on to work to school every day. Well, it is. And, and you know, while we're waiting on the grand solution, again, what's going to fix this problem as a state, uh, we have been able to make some progress. And, and I don't want to overstate the progress. I'll, I'll share with you the number. Uh, we were able to get a pool of money. Uh, this money came from uh, what is known as a surplus. Basically, we, we put together a budget each year. We do that based on assumptions of how much revenue is going to come into the state. And the last couple of cycles, we've had surpluses. Uh, when I talk about surpluses, we're talking about uh, several hundred million dollars. And so we were able to take a portion, uh, about $230 million, uh, of surplus money, uh, money that uh, we didn't expect to have, frankly, and put that into strategic road projects across the state. And so we, to date, uh, have six projects. Uh, when, when we set out on this, I was hoping to get a project or two. Uh, if we had only gotten our fair share as, a, as uh, the two counties that I represent, we would have only gotten a couple of projects. I was very pleasantly surprised we got six in the end. And uh, so we have more than our fair share of dollars coming to uh, Midland and Isabella counties. And some of these projects, uh, we're going to see hopefully some yet this year, uh, quite possibly more of them next year. Uh, but just to, to hit on a couple of them, uh, there's one that's a, uh, uh, an MDOT project or a freeway project, if you will. Uh, this is uh, US-10 uh, and that goes through the uh, north east corner of Isabella County. It's an $800,000 project uh, that's going to go on uh, US-10 in Isabella County. Uh, then there are others. Uh, these are other projects in Isabella County. We have others in Midland County. Uh, but, for example, you know, looking at a good project on Drew Road. Uh, Drew Road is out by Lake Isabella, that stretch. Uh, also a good project in, uh, on Wynn Road uh, from Remus to Wademan. Uh, there, that's a $520,000 project. Uh, another big one in Blanchard, uh, Blanchard Road, excuse me. Uh, this is going to go through Fremont and Lincoln Township from Mission to Wynn Road. That's $625,000. And there are some others. So these are, you know, when we talk about uh, it's about $2.5 million in projects, that's a lot of money. That's money that is going to have a huge impact 
uh, locally, uh, projects that simply, uh, with the dollars that the Isabella County Road Commission has right now, uh, the Midland County Road Commission as well, these projects just wouldn't get done. So this is a, a small step toward the solution, but uh, we still have more work to do. Representative, right now, why don't we go to our next poll question? Uh, what's the question? Okay, so next poll question. Uh, what aspect of the state do you see is the most critical to address? So I'm going to read you uh, five options here. Again, uh, this will provide me some feedback. What aspect of the state do you see is the most critical to address? Please press 1 for economy and jobs. Press 2 for education. Press 3 for roads. 4 for protection of constitutional rights. Or 5 for no opinion. And I'll read those one more time. Uh, what aspect of the state do you see is most critical to address? Press 1 for jobs in the economy. Press 2 for education. Press 3 for roads. Press 4 for protection of constitutional rights. And press 5 for no opinion. We'll provide just a moment or two for you to log your responses, and then we'll share those results. In the meantime, if you would like to ask a question, you can press 0, and you'll be connected to an operator with Representative Kevin Cotter. Several questions in the queue right now um, on a variety of topics. Uh, Representative, what do you think? Where should we go? Let's. Uh, it looks like our results, uh, our responses have stopped uh, rolling in here for the polling question, so let's share those results. Uh, again, the question, what aspect of the state do you see as most critical? Uh, number one was jobs in the economy, 44%, and that's actually the winner uh, tonight. Jobs in the economy, 44%. We had 8% eight, eight uh, uh, selecting ro uh, education, uh, 13 for roads. So, again, 8 for education, 13% for roads. Uh, Twenty-eight percent uh, chose protection of constitutional rights, and eight percent with no opinion. So our winner, uh, economy and jobs, forty-four percent. You know, and we talked about this just earlier, John, um, talking about Michigan being rated number two in the country. So of fifty states, uh, to this very point, talking about jobs and the economy. In this case, we were ranked number two in our rate of recovery, uh, which is significant because as you look at Michigan, um, not only did we need a, a fast recovery but we had a long way in which to recover. When you look at a state that was hit so hard, uh, we really had the perfect storm here in Michigan because not only were we losing population at the time, we had a lot of people, uh, frankly, that were leaving the city of Detroit. We are heavily reliant on the auto industry, and at the same time, there was a national recession. So all of those factors really made Michigan, I think, the epicenter uh, of the latest recession that we had, again, uh, the greatest recession since the Great Depression. And so to see that we are now ranked number two, second to only South Carolina in the rate of our recovery, I think that's pretty powerful. And, you know, Representative, you've told me several times that as you listen to your constituents, you hear small business owners, family business owners say that, uh, you know, I'm having a difficult time hiring a welder or a difficult time uh, hiring an auto mechanic. Um, there are jobs out there. And the fact of the matter is the House and the Senate just this spring actually worked on legislation dealing with maybe paving the path toward those jobs through career technical education. Now, this is uh, this is something I'm, I'm very proud of. And it took a lot of work uh, to get it done. But, but what this was, we were hearing from a lot of folks in, in business and industry. And, and frankly, this goes to the question as well. We're talking about how we're going to improve the economy and jobs. Well, you know, it's kind of a chicken and the egg thing. Uh, you know, what comes first? Is, is it a talented workforce or is it jobs? And you really can't have one without the other. And, and the issue that we were finding from so many people, and, and frankly right here uh, throughout our district, we have a lot of manufacturing jobs. You know, we have uh, a lot uh, of jobs uh, manufacturing large equipment. Uh, you know, I'll plug uh, the wood chipper industry, for example, uh, you know, something very important to our area. You look at commercial refrigeration. I mean, we have a lot of really good manufacturing jobs. And there's been a shortage, frankly, in welders and, you know, uh, technicians and looking at uh, nursing, you know, in the healthcare sector. And so a lot of these jobs we, frankly, have pushed students away from because there was a change a while back to try to push all students uh, to prepare themselves for a four-year college education. Well, that's great provided that the jobs are there, and that's great provided that that's where the students really want to be. But what about the students that really want to uh, study to become a welder? Or what about the students that want to study be to become a nurse? These are really good jobs. I mean, you look at some of these jobs in welding and nursing, uh, just to name a couple, um, and, and these are really good jobs in, in areas where um, businesses are having a hard time finding people. And so what we needed to do was to address the problem and say, okay, we need to change uh, back to 
closer to how we were before as far as uh, you know curriculum and how we were pushing students in schools and so we made it we made a change and and I think this was done with the scalpel and not the machete and we need to be careful when we're telling our schools okay we told you to go left now we want you to go right we need to be careful in that because there's a lot of time and money uh put into preparing for a uh, direction that schools have been told to go. And so what we did was we loosened it just slightly and said, you know what, we're going to loosen the foreign language requirement and we're going to loosen the Algebra two requirement because, you know what, not every student needs a foreign language. Uh, if a student has an interest, then fantastic, pursue that. Not every student is going to use Algebra two. I cannot uh, tell you the last time I used algebra. That's not a knock on algebra, but uh, I just don't use it. So if a student has an interest in, in doing something with their hands, if a student has an interest in doing something in the medical field, if a student has an interest in working on what is now a lot of computer equipment inside farm equipment, you know, as we look at GPS uh, controlling combines and things of this nature, you know, we sh we should not turn people away from that. We should embrace that opportunity and, and, and uh, support these students and give them, uh, remove the obstacles so that they can pursue those jobs. And, um, you know, I think that workers are happier when they're happy in the field in which they're in, when they're pursuing a passion and, and not being pushed in a direction. So that's something I feel strongly about. We were just able to make that change. Uh, like the changes I was talking about before, it takes time for these to be implemented. It takes time for uh, these results to be shown. Uh, but hopefully, hopefully, these changes will help us to be able to uh, provide skilled workers in the areas that uh, match up with where the jobs are. And again, if you would like to ask a question of Representative Kevin Cotter, you can press zero and you'll be connected to an operator. Uh, I know, Representative, coming up, what, a week from today, Monday, August 25th, you have an event going on with uh, an agency from the Office of the Attorney General called the Senior Brigade. What's that about? Yeah, and, and I'd like to uh, throw this out there tonight to uh, so folks can get it on their calendars if they have an interest. Uh, what we're going to do on August 25th, and uh, can you help me, John, I believe 4 p.m. Uh, is the time. We're going to do this at the uh, Isabella County Commission on Aging. Uh, it's located at 2200 uh, South Lincoln Road. And uh, so the... Uh, the goal here is, is to try to share some valuable information. We have uh, within the Attorney General's Office uh, in Lansing a, a group that works to protect citizens uh, really by educating them about identity theft. Identity theft is something we're seeing a lot of. Uh, we're seeing it in different forms. As technology advances, it's, it's allowing the, the, the wrongdoers uh, to be able to get your information in different ways. Uh, and frankly, uh, as technology advances, it just provides them more opportunities. And so what we're going to do is we're going to have, uh, I'll be there, we'll have some folks from the Attorney General's office, and it's all about education. It, it's to inform people about some of the latest scams we're seeing and how you can better protect yourself. And so if you're available on August 25th at 4 p.m., I uh, would love to have you come join us. Uh, we'll have some refreshments there, and it'll just be an opportunity to uh, to learn. Nobody's going to be pressing, pressing anything on you except for information, uh, and it'll be a, a good, relaxed uh, environment, and uh, I think you'll find uh, find something useful uh, to take home, and uh, it's hopefully something that can protect you. Uh, I've had a lot of reports recently have been coming into the office. Uh, people are saying, you know, I'm getting these uh, uh, people that are calling me at home. Uh, they seem to have my name, and they're they're uh, attempting to help me get out of debt, or they're uh, with uh, payday lending type companies, or you know, they, they runs a real gamut, but. Uh, with many of these scams, uh, the goal is the same, uh, regardless of the service that uh, they say they're offering, uh, the goal is the same, and that is to defraud you, uh, to put you in harm's way, uh, generally in a f uh, financial uh, means. But uh, So please come out August 25th, 4 p.m., Isabella County Commission on Aging. And if folks want to RSVP representative, just call your office? Yeah, if you just call the office, we can provide additional details, uh, but uh, the number in the office is 517 373 one seven eight nine, and just ask that you let us know you're coming, so we can make sure we have enough space and refreshments. And you know, Representative Cotter, uh, a lot of times I think uh, when we think about the job of a state representative, we think about someone working at the state capitol. What you're talking about next Monday, though, is maybe a reflection of the reality that so much of your job actually takes place here in your district. You know, it does. I think people often think about us being on the floor of the House of Representatives casting votes. And frankly, that's what we do a good portion of the time. But I, I would say, you know, generally speaking, it, it, it's split. It, it's probably a nearly an equal split as far as uh, days on the floor and days in the district. And I like that variety. And, and you know, I, I think that 
the days here in the district, whether it's talking to people, as I was talking about earlier, about the issues, uh, we, we mentioned road funding, you know, getting some feedback, uh, whether it's providing this educational uh, seminar that we're going to have with the Attorney General, whether it's listening to calls that are coming into folks, whether it's meeting with them at office hours, uh, you know, that's that's the role that, uh, that I serve as well. And so, um, you know, a lot of times we hear about issues that constituents are facing with state government. So let's say it's the Department of fill-in-the-blank. It could be the Department of Human Services having issues uh, getting uh, some benefits uh, or getting some medical coverage. It could be the Department of Corrections. Maybe there's some issues with the correctional system or maybe someone knows uh, an inmate that is having some issues within the prison. Maybe it's uh, the Department of Transportation. The list goes on. But we are really the liaison between the constituent in the district and state government. And, and we can provide a good bridge. We can help to get information, to help to get things fixed. Uh, just the other day we had some issues with uh, workers' compensation. Just the other day we had a call that came in and there was a, uh, a past due uh, utility account. Uh, so, so the issue was uh, electricity that wasn't paid and so the electrical company turned off the power. Well, the issue was there was a person living there that needed some medical equipment and that medical equipment needed electricity to, uh, to function. And so we were able to make a, make a contact uh, through state government and ultimately through consumers, and we're able to get that power turned back on uh, due to a hardship. Uh, so those are the types of things that we can do to help people out. Uh, so there's much more to the to the job and to the position than uh, than casting votes on the House floor. And you know, given your proximity to Lansing, Representative, there are a lot of days when you're working both in Lansing and in the district. I know a lot of times I have talked to you late in the afternoon at the state capitol and you're in a hurry to get back home because you have a meeting or two to go to that night, or maybe you're going to stop by somebody's house or small business or something like that. You know, I, I feel fortunate because, you know, for, for me, uh, from the Mount Pleasant area, it takes me an hour and ten minutes to get to Lansing. And while some would look at that and say, wow, that's a long commute, uh, compared to my colleagues, that's a very short commute. You know, we have some, uh, actually the longest commute that I'm aware of, uh, western uh, part of the Upper Peninsula, uh, one person that drives nine hours to get to Lansing. And so they're forced, to, you know, while we're in session to stay in Lansing. Well, I come home at night, and that's a big benefit because, as you mentioned, you know, some days we wrap up, uh, we might be done at 5 o'clock. Some, some days it's later. We go into the evening. But if I'm done in Lansing at 5, 6 o'clock, I can hop in the car, and I can come home, and I can be to a meeting of uh, a service organization, maybe it's a local government meeting, uh, maybe it's another event that's happening in the community. And so I, I feel that that helps me to be able to have those opportunities to remain plugged in, to be accessible, and that's something that uh, I appreciate uh, having that opportunity. And again, you're listening to a Teletown Hall meeting with Representative Kevin Cotter. Obviously, uh, a lot of issues on the table tonight. So if you would like to ask a question, you can press zero and you'll be connected to an operator. And clearly, you know, people are focused a lot on roads, on transportation funding. We talked a little bit about public education funding as well. Uh, the fact of the matter is representative. Uh, you know, when we're talking about issues facing our state, you know, when we're talking about you know, our state budget, which takes effect in about six weeks, we're talking about issues that affect and impact people literally every day and in every way. You know, it is. And I think quite often uh, people are busy, uh, you know, living everyday life. And there's so many things that go on, you know, whether it's, uh, you know, whether it's a um, young couple that, that has children uh, and everything that, you know, tending to the needs of children, whether it's, it's, grandparents and tending to the needs of grandchildren or whether it's just folks that are busy in their career or taking care of a loved one. Uh, you know, people are busy leading their lives. And so I feel that, you know, that that's really my job is, is to be the one watching when, when no one else is watching. Uh, fortunately, there are often people at home that are watching. That's where a lot of these good questions are, are coming in tonight. And, and so that is good. But, you know, I, I think that um, we want to get to that point. We want to get to that point to where, uh, you know, People don't feel that they have to be watching continuously or skeptical about what government is doing. And, and so that's something that we're always trying to work toward is just how can we provide that peace of mind that, that uh, things are, are in good hands, uh, but at the same time being open. You know, I talk about being transparent because that's the way that the public can really hold us accountable. You can't have true accountability without transparency. And so we try to operate um, in that way. You know, And as I think about transparency, one bill that I had uh, my first term uh, that I was really proud of was had to do with transparency and state spending. 
because one thing I was really blown away by when we started and we you know had a, a budget at that time we were about forty seven billion dollars at the state and I said gosh you know just to look at this budget bill several hundred pages of line items uh, of spending and how is you know John and Sally citizen at home supposed to see where all this money is going if they can't get the information. And so I had a bill that did very simply for each state department. When you go to their website now, there's a link that will allow you to see that department spending, you know, who, where the money is going, what it's going for. And so you can't have accountability without transparency. And that's just one example of how we've done that. There have been other areas as well. Uh, but, but really, uh, you know, it's no longer okay to say, well, uh, you know, it would be a lot of work to do that or techn technology isn't there to allow us to do that. Well, you know, that no longer uh, answers the question or is a justifiable answer because Technology has come so far. Um, you know, if folks don't have a computer in their home with Internet, well, you can get one at the library. Uh, you know, everyone has access in that regard. And so we can put the information out there in a very cost-effective manner, and uh, the people paying the tab have a right to see the receipt. Is that maybe the bottom line, Representative, the people paying the tab because actually Michigan's hardworking taxpayers are the ones who earned that money that in turn was sent to Lansing? Yeah, and I think, you know, any time you leave a person in the dark, it's human nature. You're going to be skeptical, okay? Because, first off, I don't have the information to form an opinion as to whether or not you're spending money correctly. Uh, secondly, if you won't show me how you're spending it, then I have a reason to believe you're not doing it in the best way. Uh, so, you know, I mean, it just all goes on. So I think that, you know, if people have access to the money, then they're going to be more content, first off, that there's no wrongdoing. And secondly that the money that they're paying, whether that's at the gas pump, whether that's at the cash register and sales tax, whether that's your property tax, whether that's, you know, whatever tax, they're going to be a little bit more content paying that because they know it's being used well. And so I think we can do everyone a favor. Uh, and frankly, it makes our jobs easier because the public is less skeptical if we'll just pull back the curtain and, and uh, show uh, what's going on behind it. You know, we've talked about a lot tonight, Representative. You talked about some of the constituent work you have done. If people do have a question, maybe they didn't want to bring it up in a teletown hall meeting, they can always call your office tomorrow or drop you an email. And I know that you, know, you do spend a lot of time, as you said, here in the district, too. It's probably not unusual for people to bump into you at the store when you're buying gas or something like that. Yeah, and I get those, and, and those are always welcome uh, as well, you know, certainly those inquiries. But uh, probably the easiest way uh, would be uh, to contact the office, uh, and I can give you a couple of ways uh, to do that. First, by telephone. I'll give you that number again. It's 517-373-1789. Or you can shoot me an email. Uh, give you this address twice here. It's uh, Kevin Cotter, so K-E-V-I-N, C-O-T-T-E-R, at house.mi.gov. So Kevin Cotter at house.mi.gov. So clearly, Representative, we've talked a lot uh, here tonight about uh, a broad variety of topics. Uh, I would imagine this sort of teletown hall is the, uh, the type of thing you will be doing again in the uh, the weeks and months ahead because, as you say, as we wrap up here, you know, constituent service in a lot of respects is the name of the game. Yeah, no, and I'll be looking forward to hearing from folks, too, uh, on how you like this format. We've done a few of these now. I've had uh, generally a very good response. Uh, it's meant to be, uh, uh, you know, not invasive in the sense that if you're available to, uh, to join us on the line, you've done that, fantastic. If you can't, then hopefully we'll catch you next time. Uh, but, again, just trying to work smarter and, uh, and harder to, uh, to be able to contact folks. And so I hope to do more of these. I'd like to do uh, another couple more uh, yet this year. And uh, so uh, until then, I uh, hope that you will uh, keep questions in mind and, and join us next time. Thank you so much for taking time out of your evening and uh, look forward to seeing you all and talking to you all very, very soon. Thank you very much.